Hello, I'm Robert, fact-checking stories that scare you. And uh, this is the idea that Russia might escalate, which doesn't make sense at all. Actually, Russia is doing really, really badly at the moment. It's uh, this, this, I don't know why it's not hitting the mainstream news, but these spectacular explosions of their munitions dumps, which look exactly like an explosion in a fireworks factory. That's an explosion in a fireworks factory uh, in 1998 in Devon. And that's the explosion of these munitions dump, dumps. And it's really quite bizarre because the um, this is an example that this is a professor of logi military logistics. His, the history of military logistics, basically, is, is one of his specialist interests. And he talks about how this huge warehouse was in the most obvious place to have a, a, a munitions dump for, for the Russians. And the Russians knew that the Ukrainians were going to have these very precise weapons about a month ago. And for the last week, the Ukrainians have been systematically hitting them. And yet the Russians have done nothing to try to move these munitions, to hide them, to do anything. Indeed, they don't seem to have done anything anywhere. They're still leaving their um, uh, huge piles of explosive shells, artillery shells and missiles and things. They just put them in, stack them in big warehouses above the ground, easy and obvious for high mass to hit. To hit, to hit. They haven't learned anything. And it's been, a, for the last week, there's been um, dozens of these spectacular explosions all over Ukraine, over the occupied part of Ukraine, and Russia's doing nothing to stop them. It's very, very bizarre. They are extremely inflexible. That's been the case all the way through the war. They are still doing point-to-point -point missions with their planes, where the planes are not allowed to divert from there. They're told, you've got to bomb this target. They then fly there as fast as they can, drop their bombs and fly back and that's the entire mission. And that is very out of date thinking it belongs in World War II. It's not modern thinking at all. And then we've seen that their navy is completely out of action because of the sinking of the Moscow. And now they're, 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 they're one superiority that they had, which was how they were managing to advance in Donbass, was through their vast supplies of ammunition. And they're not making ammunition anything like fast enough to supply their war. They've got vast stocks from the Soviet Union. Once those are gone, they've got no, no more to come. And they won't be able to sustain the war once it's all used up. Nobody knows how much they're using, but they must be losing vast amounts of it in these, in, in these uh, um, bizarre explosions. They're just piling up these bar these munitions that legacy munitions from the Soviet era, which is all they've got, and they're just piling up in warehouses in Ukraine for the Ukrainians to destroy them. And it's probable they have such vast amounts that they could keep going for a few more months, maybe even doing this. But it's a matter of getting the flow of the munitions to the front line so they can use them. And the Ukrainians with HIMARS. And now the reason that HIMARS didn't, the reason Ukrainians didn't do this before, is because they are they do have some missiles, the Ukrainians, that could reach quite a long way behind the Russian front line, but they're not very precise. So the Ukrainians risked killing Russian Ukrainians and, U and Ukrainian Ukrainians in the, ca in the captured areas. Now, the Russians don't seem to have so many qualms about doing these very imprecise missile strikes, but the Ukrainians do. So that, and that kind of tied their hand quite a bit. But with high bars, they're so precise that they, have, uh, that, uh, that they don't need to worry about that because they can hit the targets exactly, exactly to within five meters, probably better. They seem to have a range, on paper it's 70 kilometers, but they seem to be able to hit as far 
as about 85 kilometers in real life. So they have the, the designers must have somewhat understated the how far they can actually fire in good conditions. So the, the Russian occupied territory is like a castle on a made built of sand. And we saw this with the Battle of Kiev. I can go down to look and, and look this is a big first of all yes just to show there have been no there have been no advances since um, I haven't yet seen J July the 12th but since July the 6th no advances no advances no advances they captured the village of 1770 in, in peacetime then no advance then no advances I expect them to have no advances today and July the 6th was the first day of the entire war where Russia never advanced anywhere over its entire 2,500 kilometers front. No advances. That is not good news for Russia because they need to keep advancing in order to have morale, for their morale and to, to, to keep up their, their sense of energy and so on, that they can keep going. And they're not. And meanwhile, uh, Ukraine did a very spectacular win if you may remember they sunk the Moskva which was a flagship of the Russian Black Fleet and now they have won uh, the military battle to take Snake Island it's very remarkable probably the first example ever of a country without a navy winning a naval battle against a country with an extremely strong navy we just wasn't able to use it effectively because they couldn't bring their ships nearby because they'd be sunk by the Harpoon and the Neptune anti-ship missiles. So the Russian ships, they, they're just staying off. They're, they're keeping more than 300 kilometers away because that's the range of the Neptune and just won't come any closer. So it's, it's Navy's out of action, it's Air Force's out of action and, the, and they're now losing their art artillery. Now, um, what's this about? I was just speculating about that is them, sh them putting up the flags for um, Ukraine. I, 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 yeah, that's putting up the flag on Snake Island. And then, and this is about the, uh, uh, there's the claim that Russia keeps claiming it's going to escalate and escalate against Lithuania or against Finland or whatever but they're doing the opposite they're saying one thing doing the opposite they are withdrawing their soldiers wherever they can and this is an example of a base uh, near the Finnish border at an Arctic training ground and they've taken away half of the half their soldiers from there to presumably to Ukraine because they need everyone they can find and this is showing the uh, how close they've got. They're, they're actually got a little bit closer than that. You can see that this, this is how they were, then they're gradually moving closer, and then closer, and then they. And they are, but then now, now they're probably more like here, again, like that first extent now. Yeah, that's a that's a zoom in at it, and that's the latest. But then they probably the I'm not sure the ISW is very up to date on the Ukrainian position because the other reports saying they're much closer. And this shows what they managed to achieve in Luhansk. And so they did manage to capture this little pocket of Luhansk, but they failed their main objective. So their aim was to try and trap thousands of Russian of Ukrainian soldiers. But they, the Ukraine soldiers, they withdrew from Severodonetsk and then withdrew from Lysychansk and indeed the Russians were all prepared to come into Lysychansk and um, and they sent their best fighters ahead and they were hoping to capture thousands of Russians only to discover that they had, with, they had uh, evacuated long ago and they evacuated their last few thousand soldiers the night before the, the, they actually got in. So, they, and then they just had reports that 50 trucks 
I'd left the I'd left the city the night before, and the washer couldn't do anything about that because they have they have they have very little like um they have very little expertise in night in night combat or night vision. They they're not very active at night, and they 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 are not able to do um, off the cuff attacks with planes. They don't have planes just fly around able to attack, and they are very um, they're very bad at attacking with their their, their missiles. Are very very uh, equivalent photograph down here. I'll show you in a moment. There, yeah. I'll show you there. Let's just go, scroll down. There's an example of there. They claim to have hit. They claimed this was high mass, and they claimed to have hit high mass, but it was obviously they missed. And you look how far out they were. Now you look at the crosshairs. This is presumably their video from whatever they were using to target that missile strike. Because you saw a little dot dancing around. As it and, and it danced around all around there, and it ended up dancing up there, and then just before the strike, it was there, and that's where it struck. So presumably that dot was where the missile was heading, and this crosshairs, which stayed much more steady, was where it was aiming. So you can see how far it was, and they, they and this is uh, an example. The civilian casualties in Kiev, almost certainly, are actually actually attempts to hit a military facility there. Which Ukraine uses to make the Neptune missiles and things like that, but they miss by tens of meters, and so they hit civilian targets. And so Russians are useless at that. The cruise missiles are just no good. And this is probably, and their intelligence is pretty rubbish too, because it seems pretty clear that what they thought were high Mars were actually these, um, were actually, these are not the actual photograph of them, but they're actually four white oil tanks. If you look at them close up, in, in high resolution, they look they look just like oil tanks, and they don't look like high mass at all. So they seem to be pretty rubbish at their intelligence, and and then this is looking at um, no, that's that's showing that they've got two hundred kilometers they've got to try and defend. One thousand two hundred kilometers, probably more like two thousand when you do all the indentations of kilometers they have to. Defend. And they have made any progress, as I said, since the 6th of June, and, on, and the Ukrainians are actually making progress. Now, this is what happened with the Battle of Kiev. So if we look back to where it started, then this was the 31st of March, then the 1st of April, you see the dates going forward there, 3rd, and you just, they just see how quickly they withdrew, 4th, the 5th, then they were all gone, by the 6th they were gone. In just a week. So that is a region that's about the same size as the Kherson plus Mariupol region that they just evacuated in a week when they started to lose. Rough, roughly the same size, but I think it's about the same size. So the Ukrainians are ready to do a big counter offensive, but unlike the Russians, so the Russians, as soon as they withdrew from this, they immediately started fighting here far too soon, when soldiers were hugely demoralised, not ready to fight. And they just lost thousands of soldiers who weren't ready to fight, and they tried to integrate back together battalions of different, just what was left over of one, what was left over another, might have lost, one might have lost 20%, another might have lost 80%, they just crammed them together. And that doesn't work. This is not, that's not an effective fighting unit. Because apparently, I'm, I'm not an expert myself, obviously, I'm just telling you what these people say that I follow who are pretty expert. And they, and they were saying all along, this is never going to work. And then, and then indeed it didn't. The Ukrainians, the Russians were trying to capture just two small cities of 100,000 each. They spent over a month on them and they didn't manage, and they eventually managed to capture them. They didn't, ca they didn't manage to encircle the Ukrainian soldiers, which was their main aim in, in that attack. The secondary aim was to gain the whole of Luhansk. They did get that, but probably not for long, because HIMARS is very busily attacking behind the front lines 
in in uh, in Luhansk. Let's see if I've got some photos up here of what I've got some photos somewhere. I think it's up, might be down. Which direction do I go? No, it's down. So I'll just scroll down. I'm trying to find the photos of the of high Mars. Let's just scroll down a bit, a bit further. And so it's not it's not certain that these are all high Mars, but probably a lot of them are. There were 30 major high Mars strikes, you can see quite a few in um, Tonetsk, and uh, since then there have been quite a few in Luhansk, a couple in Luhansk there. And then, and then there were another um, 11 or 13 on just one night, and then the other night 14 on just one night. And these are all very precise targets hitting ammunition dumps and garrisons, command centres centres like they could doing their usual thing of killing lots of officers and generals. Now Russia has lost a huge number of generals. They've lost at least half an hour a month or so ago. I'm not sure what the latest count is of the generals they originally uh, committed to the to, to this war. And those are the top level ones, right at the very top. And they just lost half of them and then they kept on fighting. And the very bizarre thing is that Russia has not mastered secure communications. So the generals, if they want to talk to a soldier at the front line, they just talk over the cell phone or radio. And Ukrainians then are just able to uh, eavesdrop and hear what they're saying. Again, it's very, very bizarre. The Russians had a secure system, but it didn't work in warfare. They didn't seem to be able to improvise anything different. You'd think it'd be quite easy. I mean, secure communication is hardly, you know, secure protocols. There are lots of secure protocols. You could just say, you know, switch on your secure, um, you know, do everything by encrypted communications. They can't seem to do that. The Ukrainians can, but the Russians can't. They're just so inflexible. They're not able to make these simple adjustments. They just We've been told to do it this way. We always do it this way. We're going to do it this way. I know that Joe Bloggs was killed in a missile strike by doing it this way, but this is how we always do it. That seems basically the Russian attitude. And this is so built in to the way they do their fighting that it would take them years, probably, to change this. They have had it drilled in for years not to show any initiative, just to what your commanding officer told you to do. And your commanding officer, again, doesn't have any initiative. Leads the battalions, even the local commanders in the re in the regions of a, of, of a, I'm not sure what it's called, but the larger unit. They, they don't have much con command either. They just go to the top general, whoever's commanding them at the top. And they ask him, you know, what should I do next? And so that's why they, 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 they so they're going to lose. I mean, there seems no way. They just can't adapt. They can't seem to adapt. So, the and, the, and this is the Russian military bloggers saying this. So, it's uh, these are extremely patriotic, a Russian military blogger. And he says, um, I know our army is led by a bunch of untrained morons. And he says, um, the seashells, shipworms, wish no evil on a ship, woodworms on an oak tree, um, tapeworms on a bull. They just take care of themselves and their offspring. But one day the ship sinks, the uh, oak tree falls, the bull dies, and they begin to look for a terrible conspiracy. And he says that's what's happening to the Russian army. He talks about the, their stupidity. He wants to, to continue, and despite absence of any military secrecy around the supply of modern foreign long-range artillery and MLRS multi-launch uh, something I can't remember what that's called but that those that's like high mass um, missiles it's basically rockets fired from a gun as it were and with uh, because they're rockets they've got much longer distance and they're GPS so, uh, uh, so they are very precise Russia don't have GPS on their missiles 
and um, they so they can oh they're not oh it's not very effective I don't think they have any such GPS and um, the the uh, they lose one by one all these warehouses and despite the despite just the same thing as Professor Philip O'Brien was saying they've been stacking up these piles of munition and and as a result they lose the opportunity and now they have a shell hunger a wild, a wild shell hunger and these are military bloggers who are given access to the Russian front line on the Russian side and some of the military correspondents some of them are military bloggers they're extremely patriotic and and yet and this one this website if you go to it now I saw it before it was taken down I just copied that over and it's now been taken down by the Russian but that's what this military blogger said and he said that the that the Russian commanders not just the oligarchs but apparently there's a lot, a lot of corruption in the Russian army where the Russian leaders are just thinking about their own wealth and not really thinking much about helping the army to win and he's got these big army mafias who are getting a tithe of their income up to the very top and they're stupid stupid thieves like the civilian leadership of the country so this was a, a very patriotic Russian who wrote this this is not a Ukrainian saying this this is one of the most patriotic Russian um, bloggers saying this about the Russian their own army and this puts Putin in a bit of a quandary because he, these are the people who should be supporting him and he can't really crack down on them in the same way he can crack down on um, people who are protesting in the streets in Russia like he did he can't crack down on these Russian bloggers in the same way because they have thousands of followers and uh, they are as kind of central to the to Russian war effort in a way in, in motivating it so Putin is a bit of a quandary here as to how to deal with them and he's trying to kind of shame them into not doing this not not talking about the um, Russian um, some failures and using indirect methods and um, but as, as Ukraine battle map is one of the people I follow and they say Russia hasn't stopped a single high Mars attack and some strikes injure hundreds of Russians so that's one strike hundred Russian hundreds of Russians out of action they can't fight anymore and and the other ones they they one strike and all their munitions for their, their entire munitions supply for Kherson that was waiting in a big air warehouse to go across the river and go into Kherson is now gone and they now will have to bring more ammunition from Russia all the way through to through that bridge which was there somewhere I think which was blown up that's one that's blown up most recently or they could try and bring it via Crimea and again via bridge so this is does not look like a war that Russia is going to win so I hope you can see now and I just don't understand and and Zelensky is saying that Ukrainian forces are advancing in several tactical directions in the Kherson region and the Zaporizhia region we will not give up our land the entire sovereignty of Ukraine will be Ukrainian now uh, some people worry does this mean they're going to attack Crimea but uh, because Crimea the Russian the Ukrainians say is of course continue to say is part of Ukraine but and this doesn't seem likely now um, it is possible that so the idea of uh, uh, Russia escalating is utter bullshit the technical term bullshit meaning meaning that it just doesn't make it just there's no meaning to it no reading reading and it's clear that they're going to lose this war despite all the major stories it just doesn't make sense that they can win this war I'll just go through a summary there and, and like a no navy country has sunk a flagship with two low cost missiles and the territory it's newly occupied by Russia it's um, it's founded on bombed hospitals you've got to remember this what it's like for the people in the occupied territories and many of them are now being conscripted and sent to the front line where they're dying and they are it's found on the bombed hospitals homes supermarkets museums theaters and so on 
and, they, and many of the people in the occupied territories have been trapped in basements for weeks without water or food or internet when the Ukrainians finally liberate them that's what they discover so uh, so what happens next well yeah, so this is about the peace deal I was just talking about so uh, Putin has missed several opportunities for a peace deal already it would have been best to go for a peace deal before the war started he could have got far far better uh, terms if he had negotiated then he could have got for instance he before the war started and before he declared the independent republics then he still had the uh the, those put what are they called i can't remember now the um normandy protocols i think if i remembered it right which was uh which gave the russian uh government a say in the the legislature of the ukrainian government because these were part because these separatist regions were part of ukraine that was the fiction even though it was under russian control so therefore the legislature had to take account of them so they had a kind of they had a kind of uh camel's nose into the ukrainian legislature and putin gave that up with his invasion so he now has no say in the Ukrainian legislature, he can't he can't influence it in any way. It's absolutely clear because he had this fiction, and then he he was telling Ukraine, "You've got to deal with this independent republic, not with me, because they're not part of Russia." There's no way that he can use that fiction now. It's absolutely clear it's a war of Russia against Ukraine. So he's lost so much that he had by way of advantage if he had gone for peace deal then. The next point would have been at the maximal point when he was in half encircling Kiev. And Ukraine was very certain they could they could defend Kiev, but you know other parts in NATO didn't have the same didn't all have the same level of confidence as Ukraine. And it was it wasn't at all clear to most people how uh, how in what a bad way Russia was in at that point how badly Ukraine had damaged the Russian logistics. So Russia would seem very strong. And they actually said at that point, and they actually had an almost agreed peace agreement, and Russia said at that point, we are going to withdraw as a gesture of peace. But then, during the, the actual talks, before they even withdrew, they shelled Cherniev overnight, shelling and shelling and shelling, lots of shells. And that showed they weren't sincere. So he lost that opportunity for peace treaty. And so then his next, so now is his case, uh, he, could, he could go a peace treaty now. The, it's likely the most, ex the highest, large, greatest extent Russia will have for the rest of the war now, today. So but Russia's sensible move would be to go for a peace treaty right now. He could save thousands of lives of Russian soldiers and Ukrainian soldiers as well and Russians and Ukrainian civilians and he would achieve more probably in his peace treaty than if he doesn't go for peace treaty today but it's highly unlikely he does that but we now have a situation with HIMARS is devastating their, uh, their logistics it's not just the uh, munitions it's also command posts They'll be going for fuel dumps and anything that is needed to supply the war. I'm not sure if they've hit any fuel dumps recently, but uh, uh, they've certainly been hitting uh, transport lines, railways. And so there's the, so then there will be a point where Ukraine is advancing. So we've got, for some reason, the ISW is not showing it yet, but people I follow such as Wargamer 3, and he has been very accurate. He said things that has later appeared in the Institute of Study of War later that evening or the next day or whatever. He seems to be ahead of the times, and he's talking about several small advances around Kherson that don't seem to be on the ISW map yet. And he's probably right. 
because he's, he's, he's always been accurate. I don't know who he is, but he's obviously keeping anonymous on, on Twitter. But he has, has talk, keeps talking about people he talks to. He is in contact with Ukrainian soldiers behind the um, fighting the war um, throughout Ukraine, he seems to be. He's constantly talking about things they've told him. Then says, and he says things I can't say yet. And then, for instance, when Ukraine, uh, I told you about how Ukrainian soldiers withdrew from uh, Lysyshansk. Well, the first I heard of that was from Wargamer Three. Then it was, uh, and but he didn't say it. He said, "I haven't been. I, have, I can at last tell you this." I knew this you know, so many days ago, but I, I can now tell you that they have withdrawn, and he's, he, but he broke it first, of, of all the people I follow, that they had withdrawn and, and, and that the Russians weren't going to capture any more. So I, 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 he seems to be extremely accurate. And, and and he seems obviously the Ukrainians trust him with this information because um, he doesn't he doesn't tell it until it's the right time. So he seems to get it directly from Ukrainian soldiers, not from Telegram or anything like that, but just from ringing them up and talking to them. I don't know how this is possible, but uh, but this is I've been following him for several weeks now, and he several times said things before anyone else says them. So. He says that they're that they're making a lot of progress around uh, around Kherson, but they're not they're not um, but he, he can't reveal the details yet. And so and, and then he's, he's talked about one um, some things that they've they've definitely taken. So I I, I think um, it's quite likely that they're a little bit more advanced. You know, not not talking about they haven't taken Kherson yet or anything like that. But they're probably a few kilometers more advanced than in the Institute for the Study of War map, which doesn't seem to um, include all the latest um, things, because maybe Ukraine isn't, isn't sharing it, and then without that shared information, then they, they haven't got anything to go with. And the Russians are apparently not sharing it either. So I think there may be a little bit more advanced around Kherson than is being, being let out by the side. Now, um, the Ukrainians don't plan to retake Crimea. So, Zelensky is very clear on this. We know what the peace treaty will involve, and it will not involve um, a military retake in Crimea. He's, he said this here. First, so, what does victory mean? First of all, our people definitely feel victory. They will come back, return of the refugees, they'd come back, bombardments would end, we'd recover our territory, there'd be no Russian soldiers in our country. And, that's, and then, yes, I understand they will not withdraw from Crimea, and, we'll, and we'll, we will be arguing and negotiating for territory one another in south of our, in south of our territory, the Donbass. You know exactly what has to happen after which say this is our victory. So it looks as if they're, he understands they're not going to withdraw from Crimea and that Donbass will involve, involve negotiation. I was just reading that again now. I, I heard it, that's my own transcript, but I didn't I didn't read my own transcript very well. I'm now seeing what he actually said that they're going to be negotiating. I, I'm quite a fast typist, I got double checked, I was typing right didn't really think about it carefully. He said he's negotiating the territory in South of our territory to the Donbass. I know exactly what has to happen. So it looks as if he's talking about negotiation for Donbass and as to which parts of Donbass should be part of Ukraine and which part should be part of Russia. As to which part he and they will never Ukraine is never going to say that Crimea is part of Russia or that Donbass is part of Russia, but they can negotiate as to where 
the uh, line of contact will be where they're going to have a piece of treaty or ceasefire at the end of the treaty. But the further back, the more that Russia loses, the weaker Russia is before the peace treaty, then the more Ukraine it can demand. It's just the way that wars work, that the strongest party, un unfairly perhaps, the strongest party gets to dictate the terms far more than the weakest party. So now Russia will, ha will have the capability, will probably have the military capability to retake Crimea quite easily. And the reason for that is, to have there we've got the map of Crimea. So if you look at it, it's only connected to Russia by this bridge. This bridge is within uh, 200 kilometers. So suppose Russia, I think it's pretty clear that Ukraine could retake Kherson and Melitopol and, and Mariupol. And the big question is what is and Mariupol, all that's going to be retaken at some point. And then the big question would be how much of Luhansk and Donetsk remains in Russian territory and how much is Ukrainian territory. And Ukraine is less bothered by that. The Russia, Luhansk and Donetsk is an important manufacturing area, but this is extremely important wheat and manufacturing. The steelworks in Mariupol and Kherson is very important. There is, um, they would probably want to re regain Severodonetsk, but Russia has just flattened Severodonetsk and its, and its um, fertilizer factory. I mean, in terms of the economy, the Ukrainians might as well just build a new fertilizer factory somewhere else. Indeed, even with Mariupol, the steelworks is probably so damaged that they that they could as just as well build another one somewhere else. Maybe I don't know if there's anything there if it is worth rescuing. But the uh, uh, but they will want to regain Mariupol. I think that's pretty certain. It's very symbolically important for them, and it's an important port, an important location. So Ukraine is likely to retake all that area, and. There's nothing Russia can do to stop them. And I expect it sounds from what Zelensky is saying. And so Russia, Ukraine is not going to, it's not like Russia did with Donbass, where it retreated from the big battle of Kiev and then it immediately sent exhausted troops into Donbass. It's not going to do that. Ukraine has retreated from, from the, was quite a big battle for them in um, Severodonetsk and Luhansk. And then they need time to recuperate and build strength. And they, but they also have uh, a million, a million soldiers. They say about um, in total, if you take account of everything, including their reserves, seven hundred thousand, and um, the foreign fighters. There's been several. I mean, several hundred thousand foreign fighters and people who used to not, not. I'm not talking. Don't mean foreign. I mean expat fighters, Ukrainians, some of them who, who'd actually fought and uh, veterans of the wars in Donbass, who've left Ukraine and live in nearby countries like say Poland or whatever. And then they've come back to Poland to fight this war. And hundreds of thousands of those according to Ukraine. And they're trained soldiers that left to do other jobs and other things soldiers it was quite a small war in Donbass and people would you know, spend a few years as a soldier there and then go on and do something else and you know, lots of these are coming back to Ukraine to join the war and then so these are experienced soldiers and then the experienced soldiers from other um, uh, who are Ukrainians who, who, are, who are abroad who one way or another have trained in other countries and then they come back to Ukraine but they're still Ukrainian and then there's the Ukrainian uh, resistance and home guard, basically, and they have been training to resist a Ukrainian a Russian occupation. There's thousands of those as well. And if you add them all up together, together with the new conscripts, and they've been training the new conscripts, and if it's now had four, five months of war, it takes about three months to train a conscript to the point to which they're ready to go to war. So Russia has had 
plenty of time. Ukraine's had plenty of time to train lots of new conscripts as well. So th they'd be like brand new soldiers, not you know pity raw recruits, but they, they they would be trained. They'd have had full military training, and the main thing is that they also have weapons now. So it's supplying them with weapons. So what Ukraine is waiting for, some recuperation since the big battle in Donbass. The HIMARS, they're getting four more of the HIMARS every few days. They'll now at eight, they'll soon have 12, then it'll be 16, then it'll be eight, uh, 20, and eventually they'll uh, have 50. So uh, each time they get a new HIMARS, remember they managed to do a dozen or so strikes a week with just eight of them. So if they're 50, that's five times as many. Um, more than five. Um, that's six times as many as that. That would be, you know, they, they're eventually they're probably doing a hundred of these strikes of hitting ammunition dumps and uh, and um, and command posts and uh, logistics supplies and railway lines and just anything uh, military target that they can, and, and air, air, airports so thick and uh, and tanks and you know, any, any convoys of tanks that, that Russia might try to um, might might try to uh, mm -hmm. set up, then they'd be targets too for high mass. So the uh, it really is not going to be a very tenable position for the Russians because they have nothing equivalent to high mass that they can use back against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So they do have the Grad but then Ukraine can hit the Grad. You know, the Ukraine is, the, the situation's got so bad for Russia that they have been using anti-aircraft missiles to hit, to hit ground targets. Apparently you never do that. There are light munitions that are meant to, they're meant to hit, travel at great speed and hit aircraft, which are lightly constructed and they're not very good against ground targets. But Russia's gone so, they're so, uh, so devastated by this, this co constant destruction of munitions and they've lost, they've lost, they ran out of smart munitions long ago that they've eventually resorted to using their anti-aircraft missiles to try and hit ground targets. Very bizarre. So, uh, anyway, so now I'm just, I was talking about Crimea and so, in principle, once Ukraine has gathered all that, has, has got control of all that ground, which could happen in as, as early as the fall, like as early as autumn, it could be probably before winter they'll have all that. And if, if Russia crumbles as quickly as it did for Kiev, then they could have that within days. I, I don't think it's impossible that the Russians just start crumbling, but that's my personal opinion. None of the military people I follow on Ukraine on, on Twitter has been so bold as to suggest that something like Kiev would happen with Kherson. It just seems so just my own personal, you know, just saying, well, you know, what's different from Kiev? It's the same situation. Logistics is very poor. They haven't actually been in control. They're not really in control of Kherson or Meltipol. There's been a determined resistance all the way through the war in Meltipol and near Kherson as well. But there's been this active resistance movement that's been killing lots of Russian soldiers and causing lots of damage. They're, they're not in control of these places. And Mariupol isn't very well controlled. And um, they, they, I mean, they, the, they are, are in control. They don't have an active resistance there. But the civilians there are very, very not keen at all as you can understand, on the on their occupiers after everything that went through during the, the siege. So very discontented locals there who would all just about 100% be in support of the inv invaders if, if even though they many are ethnic Russians, if the, uh, the, well not the invaders, the people, the liberators really, the Ukrainians, if the Ukrainians were to come in to liberate Mariupol. Russians just wouldn't have any support amongst the local people. They'd have a, they have maybe a couple of, they have, they, they left only a couple of battalions there 
to control Mary for when he went off to fight in Tonbass. I don't know if they've reinforced it at all since then, but a couple of battalions wouldn't last very long if, if Russia, if Ukraine was to try to liberate Mariupol. So the, remember they've got 2,500 kilometres of front line and vast areas they've got to try and keep control of at the same time as fighting along the front line. They've also got to keep control of Kherson and Mariupol, which are both large cities. Um, that's nearly half a million, I think. And that's um, 200 to 400,000 400, or so. In peacetime, they're much less now. So anyway, eventually, Russia, so it seems pretty clear that Ukraine is going to be in charge of all this area in the not too distant future. Now, once they've done that, they could, in principle, hit um, the Kresh Bridge, Kresh Bridge, or however you pronounce it, which is the one, a big modern bridge that Russia did connecting uh, uh, Russia to Crimea. Now, a bridge is not, especially a big, heavy construction, modern bridge like that, is not an easy target like the Moskva. It, you can't use a couple of sea skimming Neptune. It's not going to have all, um, mis munitions on it. It's not going to have big uh, oil tanks. It's not going to be very vulnerable and it's going, going to be built to resist a very strong wind. It's not easy to demolish a, a bridge. So, but with high Mars, in, in principle, apparently they could cause serious damage to that. So uh, I'm not sure if they could, uh, how, how much it would be. When it probably wouldn't, but it would still be repairable. But they're constant, constantly attacking it with high Mars to make it un basically impassable for the Russians. So the, um, but, the, uh, so uh, 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 one of the questions that was a uh, United States was asked when they said that the, the United States told Ukraine that they to ask them to promise not to hit targets in Russian territory, and this is important because the Ukrainians have often hit used their helicopters and possibly the M seventy seven. 777 howitzers to hit targets in Belgorod, such as fuel dumps. This is a legitimate defensive target. This is not retaliation. These are fuel dumps and railway lines that were used to supply the war in Donbass. And according to the international law of, law of armed conduct, this counts as a defensive target, not offensive. And if, if a country is invaded, it's legitimate for them to attack, uh, to attack such targets. So it would be legitimate because this is a major supply line for Kherson. There are only two ways they can bring supplies to Kherson to, to fight back against Ukrainians. One is through, through the Crimea, the other is um, along the southern coast. The Ukrainians have been hitting the supply lines on the southern coast. Come to think of it, hitting there will be enough, so you don't really need to hit here to, 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 to damage the logistics to Kherson. As they get closer, once they get these areas, then, but, but uh, once they get to here, then they want to hit there, for instance. So they could just, and this is in reality what they like to do, they're not likely to really hit that bridge. But there's a political thing here that the, um, so the senior defense official said in reply, they're not aware of any preclusions preventing uh, about the Ukrainians fighting on their sovereign ter territory against Russia. So this is a political thing. If the this senior defense official was to say that uh, Ukraine can't attack the bridge because it's a part of Russia, then that would be United States legitimizing Russia's claim that Crimea is part of Russia. So they can never say that. So this was a really a rather pointless question because there's nothing that the senior defense official can say back. They can't say that uh, that their ruling, their pro 
promise that Ukraine's promise not to hit targets in Russia applies to Crimea. There's no way that the United States can say that. Ukraine could say that, but not, not the United States. Ukraine can promise not to hit Crimea. Um, it, they could tell Russia they're not going to hit Crimea. But they're, they're also probably not likely to do that, just to keep Russia guessing. But um, if they want to, Ukra the Ukrainian Zelensky could say to Russia, we're not going to hit Crimea. He could say that, but the United States can't. It's um, diplomatically impossible for the United States to require uh, Ukraine not to hit um, the Crimea. Crimea. But in reality, they, they probably won't, because they can, they can cut the, the supply lines there instead, and because it would be just a major, quite a major um, political incident, and it would raise tensions and be a risk of nuclear alerts, perhaps. I don't know if there would be. They would judge these things very carefully. So I think it's highly unlikely that Ukraine will actually, even if it once it's got all that land, that it, but I, you know, unlikely things have happened. But this is Ukraine we're talking about, and they're pretty sensible. We're not talking about Russia, which can be quite not, not so sensible. So I'm, 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 I'd be surprised if Ukraine um, does actually hit this bridge. If they did, it would be as a result of evaluating it very carefully and being sure that this is not going to be escalated for some reason. In the sense, sense there's no risk of nuclear war. Because that's the only way Russia, way Russia could escalate. It can't escalate militarily. So if it weren't for the nukes, then Ukraine could easily take back Crimea. They would um, cut the bridge, make it impossible for Russia to supply that way. Once they've captured all this region, I mean, not right now. There's no way that Russia could supply that way. They couldn't supply anything by air. They would cut this, their supplies that way. They would destroy all their logistic dumps in the Crimea. And then they just basically wait for the, for, um, they keep hitting them with high Mars, hit their command posts, hit their generals. They'd keep the, the um, Neptune would be able to keep, uh, keep them from, from even, probably once they've got Neptunes there, it wouldn't be easy even for the Navy to get into the, into the, into the dockyard there. It would be pretty hard for the Russians to could even support Crimea if Ukraine kept its current weapons and it wanted to take Crimea. But I don't think they will want to, because uh, but this is an example where the further back Russia gets, so if Russia does lose this entire area, then suddenly Crimea becomes very, very vulnerable. And although um, Ukraine would not be likely to attack it, Russia would know that it's very weak, and this would give Ukraine an upper hand in negotiations. They might even be able to diplomatically get Crimea back from Russia, because it's such an obviously weak position, even without sh firing a shot. Um, I should. I I I I wanted. I was wondering about adding a section here from Lao Tzu's. Um, the Art of War, which is a probably Taoist work on, on, on war. And they say that one of the that, the, that the best way to win a war is if you can do it without firing a shot. They say the worst way is if you have to besiege cit cit um, citadels. So they're talking about times with chariots and spears and so on, where you had to build up um, high um, earthworks outside the city to get inside it. But uh, so very ancient ways of, of combat. But uh, and then another thing that he said in this ancient uh, the Taoist art of combat. I think it's Taoist. I, I, I'll just not not say. I I'll have to try have to check. But um, he uh, said another thing is that it is not that sometimes uh, an enemy can be too hasty. So you if you in warfare enemy, the, the fighters have to time things right. I mean, you, you, you don't, there, it is possible to be too fast. So Ukraine could be too hasty if they were to rush now. But there's never an advantage in taking a long time over something when you can do it. So the Ukraine, the Russia, they're uh, not attacking for, for the six days up to um, the, uh, 
when they've got the capability to fight back for Russia to and when the situation is not getting better for them it's getting worse then it's since from the 6th to the 12th it just doesn't make sense for them not to keep going if they have that capability so it does make sense for them to have an operational pause which is where they're improving their capability so if during that time they have an operational pause which they're able to get new new munitions they're able to regroup their forces they're able to retrain and so on and get fresh forces to the front line then it makes sense to have an operational pause it doesn't make sense if you're getting weaker and weaker which is the russian situation at present so they this long pause since the 6th of july is not a sensible thing for russia to do if they want to win any more territory they should be continuing to they should be either making their situation stronger which they are not so they could be reinforcing and getting ready or they could be moving forward they're not doing either of those and they could be reinforcing ready to kind of dig in to keep the land they've retained they're not really doing that properly either they're just they're just trying rather helplessly to keep the ukrainians back and and very stupidly piling up huge piles of munitions for the ukrainians to destroy so anyway so so i don't think the russians are the ukrainians are likely to try to take crimea i think they're likely to keep that as a weak point for russians for future negotiations where they keep this they keep they say now you it's basically a reason for russia to go for a two peace treaty if they don't do crimea they say look we could easily um capture crimea we're military capable of doing it but you know, come and we, we want a peace we don't want to do this and then russia then can say okay we will agree to a peace treaty we will maybe by that point they'll say well okay we'll surrender all of donbass but as long as we can retain crimea something like that because they know Crimea is very weak so that's the way these things go in 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 in, in war that that, 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 that that once you've got if, if Ukraine is in a very strong position they can basically dictate terms so the sooner Russia goes for the peace treaty the better so this is the big hope that Russia is sensible and I mean the reason that and then the point from the Ukrainian side, their fighters are fighting to protect their armies, families and homes from Russian crimes. They do not wish to retaliate. They don't want to cause problems like the ones they've had to families in Russia. That's the last thing they want. So the Ukrainian fighters have a very different perspective from the Russians. So they're not going to attack except legitimate defensive, legitimate defensive targets. And they won't use HIMARS to attack Russia at all because they promised not to do that and they want the United States to keep sending and anyway they they are as integrated with the United States as if they were in NATO really now they've come to trust each other as much as they trust the NATO partner so they are, although they're not in NATO but after the war is over Ukraine is likely to join a military alliance of some sort not NATO so they're going to have a security guarantees and it's probably going to be mutual of some sort so um because ukrainian would be a very valuable partner to other countries and so i'll just briefly go through this this is why why put in plus i've talked about that before i don't really need to talk about that again it's why he plus he plus because he has managed to he managed to stop if you try and think about it suppose that the uh, United States had given Ukraine high Mars on the first day of the war, started training them, and then they'd have been able to start fighting back by the end of, of uh, by the middle of March. They'd be able to start using high Mars against Russia. Then the war would have been over um, sometime in April. It's probably, no, probably sometime in March, indeed, probably Russia would have given up. Uh, Putin just by using nuclear bluffs has stopped that. 
so that's why he brought he prevented and he's pre and even to, to the day to this day he has prevented um, the sort of the next thing that Russia UK, NATO could have done they could have trained Ukrainian soldiers in using the F-35 uh, fighter jets or the earlier F-16s they, they, they are now thinking about possibly doing that a few months from now if the war is still continuing the reason for that is just because of Putin's bluffs again because they're afraid that uh, that you that because Putin is bluffing about nuclear war and they know that he won't really start a nuclear war if he's if they were to start training Ukrainian fighters in F-16s but the, the the general public in United States United Kingdom or whatever they will start getting very scared if uh, if the, the governments start training Ukrainians in F-16s so it's basically Putin's bluffs are targeted at the public because these are democracies he knows he knows they are democracies he knows they can't control pro propaganda he knows that if he can scare the general public in NATO that the general public will act as a check on their governments to stop their governments from sending weapons to Ukraine so that's basically how the bluffs are working it's not really directly the governments it's the it's the people and then the politicians because they are representatives of the people and then finally the generals who and the intelligence officers who know full well that Putin is just bluffing but they are they have to do what their politicians they have to keep the politicians and the public happy that's basically how the bluffs are working and so he stopped them sending tanks for two months stopped them sending their F-35 fighter jets so there were talks about you some people like in Poland were saying well why don't we just fly in there and protect uh, Kiev with our jets and they could have done that and, and just said to Putin you can't this this is a peace peaceful operation to protect Kiev and they didn't do that because of his bluffs and then uh, they also have the Patriot system to, that they could have supplied to Ukraine to protect their cities and at last they're sending not the Patriot system but another system the one that is used to protect the uh, capital and uh, the US capital it's a very slightly different system is actually adapted from the missiles used by uh, fighter jets adapted to be used from the ground it's very similar quite an effective system and they could have supplied those in March and they didn't because of Putin's bluffs and well they could again they'd have to train the Ukrainians so that's why Putin bluffs it's not because he doesn't want the war and he'd lose very quickly against NATO the I talked about how the their um, the ancient tactics going back to World War two that, that the Ukraine the Russian planes fly point to point as I said they and the fighter jet pilots have no independent decision making these decisions are made by the general the top level general in the Kremlin or wherever he is will just say to them you've got to fly and hit this target that I've picked out on the map for you and then they fly off and they hit it and they fly back as quickly as possible and most of the targets are in the captured occupied territory like when they're attacking Mariupol because the, uh, the the jets if they fly too high they get hit by anti-aircraft missiles if they fly too low they get hit by the stingers and the star streak so the lots of the jets are being shot down and indeed several of the Russian jets have been hit have hit um, telegraph poles or telegraph wise and, and been destroyed that way not in Ukraine some just in training so they're having to fly very low and they're not very good at it because they haven't trained in it whereas the Ukrainians have the Ukrainians have done lots of training in flying very very low and they're very skilled at it the Russians don't seem to be so skilled and they've lost at least a couple of jets due to flying into into obstacles like telegraph poles or telegraph wires by flying very close to the ground to try to avoid the, the Ukrainian missiles 
and they just don't. But the main thing is, the Russians only have the M20, MiG-29, goes back to, to the 80s, I think, or something. Does it, does it say there? 40 years old technology. So their MiG-29s, and it's the only modern technology the Russians have, are, are the Su-57s, and they only have 12 of those. And they're probably not going to be very effective because they don't know how to use them. Meanwhile, NATO have hundreds of the F-35s, which are pretty much invisible to radar. The F-35s are able to shoot, are able to destroy anti-aircraft missiles to over-targeting, flying them, attack them from the air. Just, they are entire anti-aircraft um, system themselves. Because that involves a radar, it involves targeting, it involves the missiles. All that is in an F-35. So an F-35 is a self-contained anti-missile, anti-air, anti, um, anti-aircraft missile system. They destroy anti-aircraft missiles. So the F-35s could just tour over, uh, and they could send a, a few dozen into Ukraine. They are trained to patrol and, and take uh, com command the skies, command the air. They can destroy anti-aircraft missiles from the, ground, from the air. They would just fly over Ukraine, destroy all the anti-aircraft missiles. The uh, Russians would hardly be able to see them because their their radar is invisible. And you know the war would have ended very quickly. The NATO expected Russia to do something like that their side and they didn't because NATO had no idea how poor the Russian Air Force were because the Russians had only been tested in places like Syria where they had opponents that just weren't capable of fighting them. So they've never been tested before in a war like this and it's now clear they just don't have the capability. So in a war between the United States and Russia, a conventional war, Russia would lose very quickly if it weren't for nukes. And of course, I'm not saying NATO wants to, but if NATO wanted to uh, attack Russia in conventional war and Russia didn't have nukes, they, they would be able to take over Russia, probably. They'd certainly have control of the entire airspace of Russia you know, pretty quickly. So, so it's basically the nukes that stop them doing that. Now, that is a le legitimate use of the nukes going to Russian naval doctrine. So by the Russian naval doctrine, they, their nukes are to, pre to prevent, basically to prevent NATO from doing that. That's the reason why the Russians have their nukes. They know that NATO is vastly superior to them militarily, and they have their nukes just like Pakistan has its nukes, because it knows that India is vastly superior. And it's to prevent India from, in from the remote possible remote if India ever had the thought to try to invade and take over Pakistan, they won't because of nukes. That's why Russia has its. So that's legitimate. And according to the to the normal um, uh, normal way people think about nuclear weapons. But uh, this, the idea is that nukes can never be used. That's that's the according to modern strategy and the way people understand nuclear weapons today, they are regarded by as a legit among amongst the nuclear powers there are many non-nuclear powers who who don't think that's legitimate they think we should erat we should eliminate all nukes but and find another way to min maintain peace for the countries that have a weaker army so they need obviously Russia would need some guarantee if we got rid of all nukes there would have to be some other form of guarantee but for now it's accepted that that nukes can be used in that way as a guarantee that is never going to be used. So uh, it, it would never actually make sense for a country to use nukes. So even if hypothetically NATO was to invade and, 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 and take over the entire airspace of Russia, which they probably could do with their 300 F-35s, if they did that, it wouldn't help Russia one whit to use its nukes. 
육성에 의지할 수 있도록 하는 자들이 되기 바랍니다. Also, if Russia uses nukes, NATO would still have control of the air of Russia, the air of the entire airspace of Russia. The nukes would not do much to, to the command and control of NATO, because they have nuclear bunkers, obviously. They might manage to destroy some of the uh, NATO nuclear missiles, but many of the incoming nukes would be shot down. If they were to aim at cities, that wouldn't help Russia at all. So they couldn't, they couldn't win a nuclear war by nuking cities, because that's not going to just harm uh, NATO's uh, attack capabilities at all. They, and if they hit command centers, it's going to have limited effect. NATO is very, very distributed. They have an actual policy of not concentrating their forces. They learned that basically with Pearl Harbor. And then since then, even more recently, in the last few years, uh, NATO has focused very strongly on not having a concentration of their, uh, of their capabilities in any particular point. In it. There won't be any air force, there won't be any military base, but it's a concentration of a significant fraction of the NATO forces. They're very careful about that. And as soon as any war were to start, they were, would disperse their stealth bombers and time to then they always have you I think someone said recently that I don't know where to check this that the United States always have 10 nuclear subs at sea at any time for sure uh, the United Kingdom always have two France always have one the um, and, and the United States have several so for sure NATO have half a dozen probably might used to be a dozen nuclear subs at sea. Each of those has a hundred nukes, um, on average, or something like that. So, uh, the, in, 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 in several missiles, each of which has got several nukes, which can independently target it. So, the, uh, there's, those are impossible. They can't be detected. Uh, when a nuclear sub is at sea, it's very quiet. It can't be detected with sonar because it doesn't. It just has a nuclear power, and it's electrically powered, basically very very quiet. And then it's also um, can't be detected with any radar because radar doesn't travel through the sea. Sonar does, but you have to be sonar is not nowhere near nowhere near the range of radar. You may well remember the attempts to find MH370 uh, at the bottom of the Pacific. And they s went back and forth on various tracks trying to find it. To find a nuclear sub would be as hard as trying to find MH370, which they haven't managed to find yet as far as I know. So imagine, imagine Russia, they have to try and find MH370, they have to find 12 of them. 10 of them or something like that. They're not going to be, there's no chance. And they'd be very obvious. Their, their ships sailing back and forth trying to find the sub. The sub would just stay out of the way. So there's no way for Russia to eliminate NATO's nukes. So there's no way that Russia can win a nuclear war. So a nuclear war is totally pointless. It's just, so, and even, so as I said, even if uh, NATO was to attack Russia and take over the skies of Russia, with F 35s, there wouldn't be a blind bit that Russia could sensibly do about it. So, if human beings were sensible and logical, like the hypothetical Vulcans, Vulcans wouldn't understand why we have a nuclear deterrent because it just doesn't make sense. You know, the Star Trek Vulcans are supremely logical. If the defenders are supremely logical, they'll never use their nukes because it's never going to improve their situation. So, basically, Nuclear deterrent depends on uh, trying to convince your opponent that you are crazy, and that you will do something that will never, that will not benefit you. That, that, that's what nuclear deterrent is based on. It never, it would never make logical sense to use it. The only way to use a nuclear deterrent is if you're crazy. And so now human beings are rather emotional, but someone who's a nuke 
they would be hard-headed commanders. I'm not convinced they actually would use a joke. <coughs> Maybe they would. But if it actually came to it, and knowing that it would only make your situation worse, in that situation, would a, a Russian general really use their nukes? If the United States was to try to take over the whole of Russia's airspace, I don't really see. I mean, I suppose it's just because I'm trained as a logician, I find it hard to understand how can someone can be so illogical. So I'm not the best person to ask about to really understand this because I, I think very carefully and logically and it's very hard for me to understand that state of mind. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not emotional, but uh, you know, I understand how people can get emotional, but, uh, but we're talking here about a Russian commander who is trained all their life to be very cool and collected. But then we have seen people who are rather stupid in, in Kiev, in Ukraine, I don't know. Maybe they're capable of it. Maybe, uh, but anyway, that is the only situation in which it would make it would it would be sensible. And indeed, it actually it wouldn't be sensible. But that's the only situation, according to Russian military doctrine, that they would use a nuke. And then people say, "Oh, but Putin's mad. He isn't. He cares about Russia, Russian culture, and buildings and artifacts. He's like a modern day Tsar. If he uses nukes, Russia will be harmed." That's since battles of cathedral, part of the Red Square in Moscow, this, he is very, he cares a lot about the, he brags, brags about his Imperial Fabric JX. There's a, a one of the, the, an expert on, on a, a, a museum expert who visited him and he only managed to get in his good graces by knowing about the Fabric JX and he was in bad graces for not, um, not having seen them yet. And Putin cares hugely about these eggs. These are jewels in the shape of an egg that were made for the Imperial Russian Tsars and, and, and occasions of things like birthdays and Easter. And, and he, so if Putin wanted to live in a nuclear bunker, then that was the aim in life. He did, if he didn't care about FG eggs, he didn't or he only wanted to have GX to himself, he didn't care about the Basel Cathedral or anything, then he could just buy a nuclear bunker and, re and resign to it. So some people, they seem to think, oh, well, you know, he, he could just, he, he, he just, he would be okay because he'd be, but you know, if, if he was only cared, cared for himself, if he only cared to be wealthy, and so in a strange kind of way, Putin doesn't just care for himself. That doesn't make sense wouldn't be the, the leader of Russia if he only cared for himself. He has to care about Russia, otherwise it makes no sense. He would be an oligarch. Quite feasible that some of the oligarchs only care for themselves. But Putin clearly doesn't just care for himself, or he would resign as president. He would get uh, he would buy a beautiful island somewhere. He might leave the United Russia, or if he wanted to stay in Russia, he would find some beautiful place in Russia and just live there, some place that he liked. So Putin does care about something that is not himself. That's obvious. There's no way he would be president if he only cared about himself. He also cares about his children and his grandchildren. And the, the generals, they want a good future too. Nobody wants a world war. So Putin is just bluffing. He's like a poker player. That's a rubbish hand in poker. And he pretends he's a brilliant hand. So for Putin to use nukes against NATO, that would be as absolutely, he would be completely out of his mind. Like someone walking out of a 10 story window of a tall building saying, ah, everything is fine, I'm going to fly. And then even if he was that crazy, he doesn't have a literal button, he orders generals who would refuse. And then this is his former defense minister former Russia defense, uh, uh, foreign minister, sorry, under Yeltsin, and he said that Putin is a rational actor, so he's rational but ruthless. He, has, he is logical, he does care about things that are not himself, he 
is what Russian is. But he doesn't seem to have that emotional connection to all being human beings that most people have about caring about you know, people um, like all the folk dying in, in Ukraine. Maybe he lost it, maybe he had it at some point. He cares about his own people, people close to him, but from the point of view of the rest of us, he seems to have lost something. Lost something that's very, very important. That he has, he has lost an important part of his being his self. And uh, but I'm Buddhist, and Buddhists look at this and they think, you know, they feel compassion, they feel loving kindness to everyone. That's what. That's not necessarily what you're going to feel in practice, because you know it's very natural that you would hate someone like that, and that anger would come up in your mind, and you you would try to deal it with as best you could. But the anger doesn't help anyone, whereas kindness does. So, if feeling kindness, if you can, even towards someone like Putin, then that's a way you could begin. Maybe you feel a moment of kindness, and then immediately you feel anger again. But just for a moment, maybe a glimpse on it, just thinking that he's lost something of huge, tremendous value by losing that, that warmth in his heart and his appreciation of the value of human life. He's lost something of great value by um, in his life. So you think of it like he's lost. He's he cares about fabricated eggs. He doesn't care about this, which is far more valuable than even the most valuable Fabergé egg, and that everyone has. I think that uh, capability, you don't need to be a billionaire to have this. You don't even need to be a millionaire, you don't even need to be a thousandaire. You don't need to have any money at all to have this valuable treasure of the warmth in your heart towards human beings. Far, far more valuable uh, from Buddhist point of view. Indeed, the other things have no value at all. If you don't have this, then the other things are not regarded with any value from the Buddhist point of view. They're just empty shells, they're pointless. So um, so now this is to help people, people who are worried about, so I help some people get very scared about, the people very, very, very a lot in this. Some people don't m mind much about physical things. Some people get very caught up in physical things. So physical, when something physical is hurt, it hurts them almost like you know, so, so a person being hurt. For other people, they think, well, you know, as long as the human beings survive, it won't say matter what happens to the city. And even if it's an ancient building, even if it's a million years, uh, a million years old, they don't have buildings at all, even if it's a thousand years old, and if the humans survive. So some people would say, well, you know, the human beings are the important thing. And the and, and we can rebuild even we can rebuild even a thousand year old cathedral. It'd be very, very sad. But you know, the human being is more important than the cathedral. Whereas other people would say, Well, you know, I, I would give my life, you know, to save you know, a thousand year old cathedral. So people vary an awful lot in these in these ideas how they think about that. So, um, but, so, you know, some people give, would give their life for these things and some people, you know, they, they don't really see why, why they think a human life is worth more than, than, than anything, anything physical like that. So there's a lot of variety in that. But um, some people, do, it's not that they don't care about human lives, but they care about these things too. And, and so for those, this is why I had this section here to kind of reassure people who get scared in this way. And they get, very, they get personally hurt by the physical things that are being destroyed in Ukraine. So this is an example from Dresden, which was destroyed by the Allies in World War II. A lot of people forget that the Allies, the United Kingdom, the United States, etc., they did rather horrible dreadful things in World War II too. They gradually built up to it over a period of time. They got more and more destructive until eventually they destroyed an entire ancient city and they burned it to the ground and lots of people died in the fires. 
civilians. The entire city went on flames. We don't do things like that anymore, thank goodness. So, and Russia didn't do that. So another thing, if you're worried about Russia using nukes, uh, if Russia had been barbaric enough to use a nuke against civilians, if Putin had been that barbaric, then he could have won the Battle of Kharkiv very easily. They had fire bombs back then. And I mean, I'm not sure what they, they would have they have their thermobaric weapons. I'm sure they could fit them to a plane. They could just fly over Kharkiv and drop bombs that would set the entire city to on flames until the entire city was burnt. That's what we did with Dresden. We could do that much easily. Russia could have done that much easily. They could have done that on the first day of the war if he was that brutal, which he wasn't. So, you, so Russia does have a limit. Putin does have a limit. He, can, he, he turns a blind eye to war crimes, to very serious war crimes, but he doesn't do mass destruction of cities like the Allies did um, during World War Two. There and with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of course, with the United States, but there were many cities destroyed in Japan in the same way. So that's a good example of Russia is not as ruthless as he's not as ruthless in that sense. And it's not that we didn't think of ourselves as being ruthless back then. They just had, they just got used to it over the war and just didn't think about it. Now, I think they, they, the world was much less connected back then. People in the United Kingdom couldn't have sent a text to someone in, in Dresden. They knew nothing about them. They were just people that, you know, that cy ciphers on a map. They weren't real people to them, really. I think that's how, how it became possible. I think that's at least partly why it's no longer possible because the world is so connected and people actually know people and you get videos shared you can hear them talking live over um, video on YouTube and so on so we can't treat them in such a callous way because uh, we, we realize we can't help but see that there really are people like us so I think that's part of I think as time goes on we're going to become more and more civilized I don't think we are a civilization yet, really. I think that really we, we, we are starting to become civilized by um, things like the way we're working together on climate change globally, the way we're working towards zero hunger. I think until we have zero hunger, then I don't think uh, an alien, an extraterrestrial who is a thousand years ahead of us in civilization would think of us as civilized. How can you be civilized if people die of hunger? It doesn't make sense. So no, we're not a civilization yet, but we're on our way. We're on the first steps towards becoming a civilization. And once we become a proper civilization, I think we're headed that way. I think it's pretty clear that that's the direction we're going. Then I don't think we'll have war. I don't think people will be killed. We'll still have um, disputes for sure. We'll have, um, well, like the Olympic Games, we'll have contests anyway. And we may have people who enjoy violent sports like like, um, like wrestling or, uh, you know, there might be people who enjoy, but not killing people. I don't see that as being a part of a civilised future for any, for any civilization. I think when we, if we meet, I think that's why it's so hard to spot extraterrestrials because they're civilised. And because they advance to the point where they have minimal impact on the galaxy, galaxy protection, um, planetary protection, and civilized, and very much like the extraterrestrials in ET the movie, but without the sentimentality. I think that's where civilization is headed. Anyway, if you look at that, that is how it was. That's how it was restored. This is. Um, yeah, sorry, that's that's not that's that's not Dresden. Sorry, that's not Dresden. That's the result of an earthquake on San Francisco, and that's the same place destroyed. I'm not sure if it's from the same position. No, I don't. It's the same place anyway. Well, this was just destroyed back then. That's the rebuilt, and that was rebuilt in just three years. It took three years to get from there to there. So Mariupol could be rebuilt in three years easily. 
And now this is another example. That is that is Dresden. That's how it was, and then that's how it was restored. No, that's how it was before it was it was destroyed. That's like that before the picture there. That's before, after, then restored. Before, after, after the um, fire from the Dresden, and then restored. Similar, very similar to the original. Then restored. So Ukraine is going to do that. Now, if you have a look at these two videos, and there, it's going to cost 750 billion. There's some talk it might come half a billion, to half a 500 billion might come from the Russian oligarchs. And um, uh, Russia would complain, but you know, there's not much they can do. I'm not sure how much they can do. And from could come from the Ukrainian, the Russian foreign reserves, it could come from other places. But uh, it seems likely that one way or another, Russia is going to be made to pay for it, pay for part of it anyway. And um, this is the example, that's the Acropolis in Athens. And that's, uh, that was much larger before. And it was destroyed. This is an example. This is an example. This was basically a Statue of Liberty from ancient times. And we think of the Statue of Liberty as being quite small. Really, well, big, but we don't think this being the biggest thing in the world. But back at the time of the uh, of um, in in Athens, uh, sorry, Rhodes, because it was the Colossus of Rhodes. It's about the size of the Statue of Liberty, and it was the biggest statue in the world by far, back then. And that was destroyed, and it's never recovered, never been restored. And then this is an example. Uh, this is the uh, video by. Uh, it's a video by poetry by Shelley, and it talks about uh, it talks about these My name is, name is Ozzy, Ozzy Mandus, King of Kings. Look at my works, you mighty and despair, and of that glass colossal less wreck, boundless and bare. But yeah, bound to the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So this is an ancient city that was surrounded by sand, which you just saw is a fantasy from Shelley based on an actual, um, possibly based from this actual statue, that he saw a statue in, in the sands in, in, in Egypt and surrounded by sand uh, where there used to be a city, or where he fantasised there used to be a city, and there certainly are plenty of cities that were replaced by sand. So this happens in the past. Cities come, cities go, uh, sometimes they're very populated, sometimes they're not, sometimes, and then they build things. Lots of, I should add a thing there, I've got a, I've got a, uh, a whole lot of things that are being built in the world. New, new cities, new um, buildings are being built constantly in the world. And it seems likely that Ukraine will take this opportunity to build, not just rebuild old things, which it will do, but also build new, 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 build new, build in a green way, a renewable way, things like that, build in, uh, in ways that are, uh, that are internet connected and, 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 and you know, are more, are more modern, uh, country, a better, a better, a built, rebuilt back better. Now, this last bit is about, it's about us and what we can do. So we can't do anything to stop this war. But what we can do is protect our own minds and help those around us with kindness. So I, I have to talk about this war, sadly, in order to help people who are scared. But I can't stop this war. I've got nothing to do with it. If I was there, I would be a conscientious objector. I wouldn't take part in it. I would, uh, what I could do, so, because as a Buddhist, I took a vow of not killing anyone. It's a basic vow that many Buddhists take. So I can't be a soldier. But uh, 
I could save lives. Not, not all Buddhists take that. There are Buddhist soldiers indeed, but many Buddhists take that vow. And um, so, and, and Buddha actually taught people, it's not often talked about when, when people g give the teachings of Buddha, they don't even often talk about these teachings, but Buddha did teach kings of his day. And he didn't tell the kings to disband their armies. So there are Buddhist um, soldiers. Uh, Buddhist countries do have to defend themselves. But most Buddhists uh, um, take a vow of not killing. A lot, of, a lot of Buddhists, actually, a lot of Buddhists, if you if not, not, I wouldn't say most Buddhists, especially, um, a, a lot of Buddhists take that vow. It's an optional vow you can take. And it's quite a common vow to take. And I take, I took it. And anyway, so, um, so if I was in the Ukraine, I couldn't take part in the war as a fighter, but I could take part to save lives. And so different conscientious objectors have different ideas about that. But in my case, the way I understand my own situation as a Buddhist who's taken that vow, it's not a vow against helping people who have been killed. And I could be on the front line and there could be other people around me who are shooting, so, who are shooting soldiers on the other side. And I don't have a vow to stop them from shooting either. But I do have, I, I, but I do have a vow to not shoot anyone myself and not support them. I couldn't, I couldn't hand ammunition to a soldier or anything like that. I couldn't tell a soldier where to, where to point his gun. But I could um, be a part of an, uh, an emergency ambulance you know, going out there and, and collecting with the soldiers and bring them back if I as a paramedic if I could be trained in that way for instance so so that's that's how I see it so um, so you uh, but you don't you know if, if, if you're a soldier it doesn't make any difference you can you can develop kindness as a soldier there's nothing wrong with being a kind soldier you um, kind to others around you you, you know that you have to kill someone in a situation if you if you were called to duty and you were and you were ordered to shoot then you have to shoot but that doesn't stop you having a life full of kindness wherever you can find it and wherever you can be kind and indeed in uh, in Buddhist teachings there are some situations indeed there, is a, there are situations my, my Buddhist teacher taught to, taught me about this when he when he gave us the vows not killing and it's quite a common thing that, to talk about then you, you, you there are situations where Buddhists break their vows of not killing and he gave an example so it doesn't mean that you that you are, have a let out from killing it means that you found that something else overrode your vows and that can happen and so he gave an example that if you were in a city and there was someone there with a nuclear bomb and they're about to set off that nuclear bomb and you have a gun or something or you have access to a gun and you could shoot it and you could kill this person then you save their life no you don't save their life sorry you 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 but they were going to die anyway they were going to kill uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people so you save all those people's lives you save your own life of course and then you do kill that person, but from a Buddhist point of view, you save them from the very harmful action that they were taking. And we think in terms of you know, they could they could have another rebirth, it could be an unfortunate rebirth as a result of that. And then in the moment of actually killing this person, then to the very most you can find within you, you'd try and experience, you know, try and have it out of loving kindness towards this person. That's how Buddhists think about that situation, and you try, and then you would, you know, and keep uh, uh, dedicate all, all the good, all the good that came from this to them, and try and take all the harm from it to yourself. And and that that's how how Buddhists would think about that situation. And you you try to think about that like that. You know, it's not that you can actually take the harm to yourself. It doesn't mean that the harm does come to you, but it transforms how you think about yourself that you 
take, take your account yourself. You give it all, whatever you, kindness you can to them. And, and then you think about this person and you're trying to help them as best you can by killing them. So, um, you, you, so that's how Buddhists think about it, but it's a very, I mean, it's a very rare situation. It's not like you go around killing people thinking you're helping them, it's not like that. But in very extraordinary situations, there have been historical examples of Buddhists that have done that. And, and then once you've done that, you've, you've, you've broken your vow of killing or of not killing and you, you, you can't really kind of come back from that. So, um, well, you, you can vow not to kill again. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happens after that. I'm not really sure what happens after that. I didn't really, haven't really talked. We didn't really talk very much about that. But um, that that would be the complete breaking of your vow of killing to do that. I'm not sure if you can take it. I don't know if you can take it again. So anyway, so try and develop that. But you. But, but try and develop kindness towards everyone as much as you can, as you can find in your heart. And, and the warmth and kindness, then look around you at the people around you. We are surrounded by kindness. Most of the world is completely peaceful. You are not, um, you, I, 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 some of the people watching this will be in Ukraine. And so, obviously, you have a possibility that one of the wild, uh, uh, that one of the drones from from uh, Russia could hit you by mistake, but that would be much. That's far, far less likely. You're far more at risk from a car traffic accident than that. It's not very likely at, at present, unless you are in one of the occupied territories or on, on the front lines, and you. And the people in the front lines, they've been asked to withdraw. So you know, if you are, that's a sensible thing to do is to withdraw from the front lines. But so most people, even in Ukraine, are at peace, apart from people in the occupied territories and the soldiers. And the people who just don't, just not willing to withdraw from, from, from the front lines, although they're civilians and they can't do anything. So apart from that, even in Ukraine, most people are at peace at present. And in the rest of the world, there are other areas that where there's fighting going on, and people just don't really pay much attention to them. But the, this is not the only war in the world. But most of the world is at peace. So try and connect to that, and just think about you know how wonderful it is that most of the world is at peace. And we've moved forward since times in the past when it was wasn't so much peace as there is today. There's much less crime in the world than there was in the past. If you look, you know, even um, the shootings in the United States, it's far less than if you go to past centuries. Most of the world is at peace. War crimes are very rare and they are newsworthy because they are so rare. As the Dalai Lama feel like this, love and compassion predominate in the world. This is why unpleasant events are news. Compassion activities are so much part of daily life, they're taken for granted and therefore largely ignored. So try looking around in your life and just try being a bit more aware of this ordinary, these um, compassion active activities that are just taken, we just take for granted and ignored. And you, you, you'll find that you're surrounded by kindness everywhere, all day, whenever you're interacting with other people, they show kindness. And it's only occasionally, and then if you have a day where you have, you know, uh, 16 hours, if you have 15 hours of kindness in the day, and one hour of unkindness, you only remember the hour of unkindness. It's not like you pay remember much about the, un the, the one hour, the, six, the 15 hours of kindness. It's just, just the way, because kindness is so natural to us, we just don't dwell on it. So it's quite good to try and pay attention to that. And then think, 
this is not a world war and it's not the biggest war in recent European history. So try to limit your exposure. And just, you don't need to check up. I mean, I check up on the war several times, many times a day because of the people I help. It's basically part of my voluntary work. But you don't need to. You, If, if you check the check the Ukrainian war once a week nothing much happens there's very little there's no change between now and a week ago in the last week I don't think anything has happened except more high, high mass strikes I mean you could just check a week later and say oh okay they've, they've worked Ukraine's now with high mass and they've been doing more of those if you checked in on 31st of March you wouldn't know that that, 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 that Russia was about to invade was was about to retreat, you could check back on the on sixth of April, and someone would tell you, oh, Russia's Russia's retreated from Ukraine from Kiev, and they lost the Battle of Kiev. Well, I mean, it is quite nice to know that straight in the earlier, straight away, but I mean, if you were, if this was like happening in nineteen sixty, you'd only check the news for. Uh, I try and think how much you, you try and guess, but I I got it on the screen, so you guess pretty easily how many minutes we put into checking the news then we would have 10 minutes of TV that's all our news programs were very short in the 1960s we didn't have one hour news programs it was 10 minutes and then you'd read it in, in, in the paper in the morning and you might if you had lots of time, you might spend 20 minutes over breakfast reading the news and chatting while you were reading it and not and maybe not paying that much attention to it. Or some people like, like to just be kept in complete silence. And they just read the news over their coffee in the morning. So you'd have 20 minutes of just sitting and reading the news for people who like to be very up to date on what's going on. And that would be it. That's all you'd know about the war. 20 minutes of reading in the morning, 10 minutes of TV in the evening, TV in the evening. And we had wars, and that's all we knew about, like the Falklands War. That was a bit later than that, but you know, you, you, you wouldn't spend much time knowing about, you wouldn't know much about the Falklands War in the United Kingdom. You, you just catch up on it you know, about once a day, if that. And be easy, you could easily go for several days without knowing what's happened. And Yugoslav wars, you know, we, we knew very little about what was happening in Yugoslavia, in the United Kingdom. We didn't know anything. I mean, I, I, I think most people in the United Kingdom, they vaguely knew that a war was going on in Ukraine, in Yugoslavia. They knew nothing about the details of what was happening. Or they forgot very quickly. So you could try to simulate what it's like to be in the 1960s and give yourself only 10 minutes a day to check the news. And do that for a few days. I think you'll get much less scared of the Ukraine war. That's 10 minutes for all the news, not just, not just 10 minutes for Ukraine, 10 minutes for everything. So for instance, um, you know, the, the right now in the United Kingdom, that 10 minutes would be pretty much totally devoted to the new Prime Minister, whoever's going to be the new Prime Minister, and all the discussion of that. And there'd be almost nothing about Ukraine if this was in the 1960s. And people would just say, oh, you know, they'd just be talking about the new Prime Minister, they wouldn't talk about Ukraine today. So, uh, um, so try and ground yourself in kindness and then try to replace anger with kindness so uh, it's very easy to make yourself more angry so just thinking over and over again like for instance about the war crimes or about the people in Ukraine the Russians and what they did or think about Putin get more and more angry about Putin and then when you do that it impacts back on your mind and makes you scared and you, you get false ideas about him you think he must be mad. You you picture him as a kind of demon or something. You probably distort his face in your in your in your mind. And 
You're not going to think clearly about him. And then who does this help? Nobody. He doesn't he doesn't do anything. Putin doesn't even know that you got angry with him. There's nothing you could do even if you were in his presence and you were angry. There's there's no benefit to you from getting angry with Putin. The only thing the only thing that, that does is harm you and make your mind disturbed and unhappy. So try to ground yourself so if you can, try to try not to amplify your hate for Putin or for hate for others and the other commanders and war criminals and so on. The uh, the Ukrainians they talk about the despicable ten or whatever it is that did the war crimes and the orcs. I think they kind of try to de take the pangs out of this a bit by using humour. So you can try that a little bit too, because the way that Tolkien writes about orcs is with a sense of humour and with a sense of kind of almost compassion for the orcs in a way. He sees the orcs as being twisted by Sauron and not really, and, and he, he, it, is, it is a kind of compassion in, in the way he writes for the orcs, in, uh, writes about the orcs and the limitations of them in, 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 and it's even more so when he writes about the goblins who are actually the same ones in, in The Hobbit but they're just more mischievous but they actually they evolved into the orcs in his thinking anyway uh, so if you, if you can just if you can't um, develop kindness then just try to be not amplify your hate, not think it over and over. Instead, just do other things and not reinforce it, not read the things or watch the things that make you angry and do things that, make, that help you be peaceful. Because there's, there's, there's nothing that this can do to make you angry. It won't help anyone. It'll just make you unhappy and scared. And this thing, um, it's another thing from the Dalai Lama. He says, uh, when we face some problem, there's a way to work on it and make effort. But the situation is such that there's no way to overcome it, then there's no use in much worry. And the uh, Dalai Lama has seen much, by the way, of problems. Remember that the Chinese they um, invaded Tibet. He fled. From, he he met um, Ma Ma Tse, Ma, Ma Tse Tung, I think. Chairman Ma, sorry. He he met Chairman Ma, and um, uh, he he tried to negotiate uh, some kind of independence for Tibet, and it didn't work. He had many problems then, trying to trying to negotiate independence for Tibet and then eventually when they attacked and then he fled from Tibet and he's now an, a monk in exile and he's, he's faced many many problems but you know, he says you know when you face some problem if there's some way to work with it and make effort like he did with Chairman Mao the situation is such there's no way to overcome it there's no use in much worry and so this is a, a sensible approach to life. So there's nothing that I can do to stop the war. There's nothing I can do to bring about sudden peace in Ukraine. The only th the one thing I can do is help people who are scared. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm doing, my, uh, hopefully I'm helping you a little bit by doing this. And you can maybe help other people. Like if you are in our doing state of our group, then you're helping other people there to be less scared. So I don't think that's nothing. And uh, we, again, another thing in Buddhism, never think anything is nothing. If, you, if you're doing it with uh, kindness to help others, and it's simple, like giving a, someone just a simple glass of water, then that can be absolutely vast in, in, its, in its effect. That can be something vast, vaster than, than huge treasures 
given a miserly way. If you be give all the gold in um, the Bank of England or whatever way, Fort Knox, to someone, but you have a miserly mind and a, a tight, angry mind, or if you give someone a glass of water with kindness and openness and you know, wishing to help all beings, then to the Buddhists, that glass of water is far, far, far more um, generosity, far more in its in its effect than the person who's able to give them a ton of gold. So that, that's how we think about it. And I think it's quite an interesting way to think about things. So you, you can't measure things by the financial value, you can't measure things by how impressive they seem. You, 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 you just don't know the effects of giving someone a glass of water. And they, they just ripple out and out and out. And if you do that with kindness, then that kindness ripples out. And the, the kindness ripples into yourself and out again and in and out and in and out. And there's no knowing what an eventual effect could be of the kindness of giving someone a glass of water with complete openness and completely, complete generosity, complete kindness. It could be vast beyond measure giving someone a glass of water. So try, it may help to just little things. When you do little things, don't think they're little. Just think if you know, they, they're vast, everything is vast, potentially vast. So uh, just, you know, just do, do, do what you can to be kind. And um, yeah, that, that's it. That's, that's, my, that's my video finished now, I think. So I hope that this has helped some of you to be a little bit less scared and, and, uh, and bring some peace of mind to some of you. And so I'll upload this to video, to YouTube. Do like and subscribe my, my channel and video on YouTube. This is my blog. I'll put a link to the blog post in the video description. And especially if you are knowledgeable about things that people get scared of, or you're scared yourself, or you're just good at helping people who are very um, scared, or you, you know, you, if you're very used to working with people who are bipolar or who have are autistic or people who are very imaginative. These are the main people who get most scared in our group. And uh, then we're, you're very, very welcome to our Doomsday Debunk Facebook group. Do read the, uh, the, the list of rules that are pinned to the head, head of the group before you comment or post. They give basic rules to that help help it to uh, run smoothly and uh, and if, if any of you want to talk talk to me via PM I do my best to answer um, all, all PMs I get and uh, there are quite a few others in the group who, 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 who can be helped who can help you via, via PM so uh, and, and, and then commenting on the post and in my, my YouTube video so anyway I hope, I hope this helps some of you and if you made this far then th thanks very much for listening and I, I do the video at the end and I, and I glad, glad, you, 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 glad, glad you find it helpful because you must have to have got this far by now and uh, I'll be doing more videos. I may do a short version of this video.